So happy to have you with us and uh, the occasion for you to come here is apart from many other reasons <laughs> that we would welcome you very much is the launching of a new book which is Inside the Euro Crisis. Um, I read the blurb or the introduction, it sounds extremely exciting. Probably for the viewers you can uh, tell us a little bit um, about uh, the tensions between politics and economics which you describe very much in, the, in this book. Indeed, this book is about uh, becoming a finance minister of a non-Eurozone uh, country, but still linked to the Euro, Bulgaria, through a currency board arrangement. Uh, going to my first few meetings of finance ministers, so-called ECOFIN meetings in Brussels, and understanding that actually there is little finance and economics going on, it's mostly about politics. <laughs> And when it's about politics, it's usually about how to delay decisions, how to not really take decisions and hope that good things will happen uh, by their own uh, accord. So my frustration in the first two or three years while at ECOFIN was that as an economist, most economists actually early on knew some of the basic decisions on how Europe can um, reduce the influence of the financial and banking crisis. But many of these uh, decisions were not taken for two, three years because politicians just couldn't take, take them seriously enough to say, let's just do, uh, do this. You also described quite uh, uh, interestingly the tensions between those finance ministers who were trained as economists and those who were not trained econo as economists. Can you describe the relationship between these two groups? Well, that was another surprise. I was coming from the World Bank, where I was chief economist for, for finance and private sector development, coming into um, Europe when the crisis already had started, first with Iceland, then Ireland, Greece were already having some uh, issues. I naturally expected that there will be a lot of economics expertise put onto this issue, how to avoid or at least to lessen the, uh, the crisis. And to my surprise, when we were introducing uh, to each other the various, uh, the various finance ministers, I discovered that something like a quarter, seven out of 27, had an economics or financial background. Um, everybody else was essentially a politician. Um, now in normal times, maybe that's okay. Uh, but in this kind of times, it created early on a lot of completely unnecessary, in my view, discussions and a lot of delays where even on some very basic views on how you deal with crisis response, we would have disagreements simply because people didn't have the experience. Did the politicians attack you for being too inflexible, not to understand the political processes which take longer and are much more complex than as economists we are trained to think about them? But the main split was between the economically trained uh, people and there were several very good economists like Anders Borg, the finance minister of uh, Sweden, uh, Jan Rostovsky, uh, uh, Paul and Luxembourg, uh, mm -hmm. Jean-Claude Juncker and so on, and the majority of politicians who basically were saying, let's just wait, we don't have to make decisions, it's going to come around. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to make decisions because then the blame, if you like, the burden is on us. And I think Europe lost two, three years, this is what I've described mm -hmm. in the book, by not taking decisions and the cost of the crisis for individual countries like Greece, uh, like Spain, like Portugal, but overall became a lot higher than they would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, reading the introduction to your book, it seems that as you come towards the end of it, you draw a rather optimistic picture that you believe in the stability of the Eurozone context. And in fact, you go that far to say that it should really be, one shouldn't make any waivers anymore, that any country which joins should immediately join the Eurozone. Can you explore this, why you come to this rather optimistic outlook on the Eurozone? Well, you start from a very pessimistic assessment that if Europe can survive this last period of five years without having many economies <laughs> who actually <laughs> deal with economic issues, without having the European Commission being very active, this is another point made in the book, that the European Commission played very small part in the making of the decisions. It was left to the large countries and to the grouping of uh, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Finland in some sense, and some other countries like Bulgaria who tried to help to make the decisions. The Commission itself was taking a, bet, uh, a back uh, seat. I think both of these uh, contributed to the crisis being a lot longer and a lot more painful. But now we have these lessons and we survived the crisis even with this. Well, imagine if we have good economists and a well-functioning uh, 
commission um, uh, how how much better we can uh, we can be but i think after this crisis also everybody in the end did understand europe needs each other you cannot say to greece you're bad leave we don't want you anymore you cannot say to anybody that because the decision is already taken and you have to live with uh, with it so that's why ultimately i i am quite positive on the future of both the eurozone and uh, uh, european uh, project and go as far as saying not to have this uh, discussions of once somebody has entered uh, are they going to be in the eurozone not in the eurozone when uh, and so on i think it's a lot easier just like some of the other uh, conditions for entering the european union on environmental issues uh, um, human protection and so on issues to say everybody enters the uh, the eurozone and this is the time that they that they enter not to have these delays that uh, cause a lot more confusion. There are two areas where I feel that you still feel there are big problems to be overcome. One is the deepening of the fiscal arrangements. I don't use the word fiscal union because yeah. we are We're far away far. from that. Uh, also partly because of the lacking expertise in Brussels, what you're saying. And the other one is the north-south uh, problem, the problem of external disequilibria inside uh, the European Union. Now, these many people would say these are absolute necessary conditions for the Eurozone to function. Nonetheless, you are rather guarded about painting an optimistic picture to deal with these two areas. In the area of fiscal um, adjustment, fiscal uh, responsibilities, uh, this was one of my, uh, let's say, research areas in the past, so I was quite active together with a number of other finance uh, ministers to, to try and get at least some initial uh, initial agreement in uh, in place. And we actually failed. There is no agreement in place currently, or not only a fiscal union, but even steps towards a fiscal union. Frankly, by early 2013, people were so exhausted that once there was an initial step towards banking union, everybody felt we've done enough, the next commission and the next <laughs> set of ministers should uh, should deal with it. So we've been delayed and I actually don't think that in the next two or three years we are going to see much progress on the fiscal side, which is unfortunate, we need it. Otherwise, uh, both individual countries and the Union as a whole is prone to having repeats, reoccurrence of, this, uh, of these issues. But there is no political energy now, at least, to um, deal uh, with that. There is also some substantive disagreements, and the book described some of these. For example, should tax harmonization be part of a fiscal future fiscal union? Some countries strongly believe, like France, strongly believe, uh, your ministers as well representing at the time uh, Maria Factor, strongly believe that you need tax harmonization for a fiscal union. I don't believe so. In fact, I think that that may be detrimental. But we also have some substantive issues that not just politicians, but also um, think tanks, academics have to have to mm -hmm. agree. And that to a large extent spills to the topic of North-South. Mm -hmm. There are several topics of which tax harmonization is one, common euro bonds is another one, several areas that are not strictly political areas. They are areas where academics and think tanks and policy makers first need to convince each other and then presented to the politicians. Currently, we don't have even a menu of choices for the politicians, and they're not going to take decisions, as I mentioned earlier. But these issues of runaway competitive positions of the different members of the Eurozone, which one normally sees as North-South, but of course some of the Eastern European members might still be, might also be conducive to that. How would we, we come to, to how, which steps would have to be taken? to deal with that issue. In Austria, for example, it worked with a very rigorously organized incomes policy framework, yeah? but there's not much basis in many of the countries to go that uh, in this direction. Especially in the South, uh, yes. indeed. I think Eastern Europe in that regard, and we saw this through the crisis that in 2008-9, the divide in the European Union was North uh, or, or, if you like, West uh, and then East. Mm -hmm. New members in Eastern Europe versus the rest. By 2010, the divide, and certainly now, the, divan, the divide is north-south. In other words, Eastern Europe, to a large extent, is co-opted uh, in the north because many of the policies that you espouse in Austria, in Germany, in uh, Finland, in the Netherlands, actually policies that we in Bulgaria also had to implement. Uh, strict fiscal discipline, some of the income policies that uh, you mentioned. While in the south, many of the countries are not ready for that because they don't have the... the 
uh, labor reform that should accompany that or even uh, precede it, the pension reform that uh, should precede it, the education reform that should precede it. I'm not saying that in Eastern Europe we've resolved all of this, but many of them we had to do over the last 15 years coming out of the communist uh, era. So I think Eastern Europe is a lot closer to your point of view and to the Nordic, Nordic point of view than the South. There is this division and uh, this is one of the chapters in the book that uh, describes the remaining agenda. The remaining agenda, and something we didn't get into at all, is the so-called growth agenda. Mm -hmm. We tried several times, uh, several of our countries, to bring ECOFIN to discuss how Europe in the next 5, 10, 20 years is going to grow. Because if you have better growth, a lot of the crisis issues mm -hmm. are going to... Now on the growth issue, also economists are not <laughs> towing the same line, isn't it? Some people say uh, one should loosen the fiscal conservatism. Yeah? Other people say this is a necessary condition and it should all be a function of structural reforms. I know your position is much more in the direction of uh, fiscal discipline and structural reforms, but it, the pure existence that both these two camps exist shows that it's an unresolved issue how to generate growth in Europe. No? It is an unresolved issue, but I think the job of academics and uh, advisors, uh, experts in the think tank community is to present the options and then ultimately it's for politicians looking at the options to decide. So I don't think that is the job of researchers, of people who write books mm -hmm. like this one, to make the decision. They sh just should be presented in a way mm -hmm. that one can see the costs and benefits. That so far is not, uh, is not uh, done adequately. More importantly, there isn't the forum in the commission that uh, who is the person in the current commission that actually has to deal with these competitiveness issues. It's not clear. Mm -hmm. So some reorganization of the commission, hopefully the new commission, uh, may make that uh, possible. Okay, I think thank you very much. Yeah.